This episode of Redneck Gamer is dedicated to my good buddy, Red Thunder Gaming. This guy is really freaking awesome. He's a hell of a gamer, and he makes some really kick-ass reviews. So I'm going to leave y'all folks a link to his channel in the description below. Check him out. And Thunder, if you're watching, thank you very much for your support and friendship, bro. Consider this a virtual fist bump. And keep on being awesome. Folks, let's talk a little bit about franchise spinoffs. Ah uh, yes, spinoffs. That age-old media tradition of telling a side story from an existing series or just milking a series to the point of drying it out. The practice of spinoffs originated with old radio shows, then that eventually led to TV show-based spinoffs, movie spinoffs were not too far behind after that, and finally, spinoffs made their way into the realm of video games. Now, when it comes to this particular media, video game spin-offs are usually developed and released out of a necessity rather than for any other reason. A good example would be the numerous Resident Evil spin-off games, six in fact, that were released between Code Veronica and 4. Now, to be fair, these games, for the exception of Gaiden, did tie into the Resident Evil continuity, somewhat, but they were released more to fill the gap between one main game and another. In other words, spin-off video games are usually made to tide fans over until another main game is put on the shelves. There are many game franchises that have spin-off titles. There are Mario spin-off games, there are Far Cry spin-off games, and the game that we're taking a gander at is a Sonic the Hedgehog spin-off titled Sonic Spinball. Yes, I did think it was necessary, Shasta, and I'd appreciate it if you'd stop ragging on me on how I conduct these reviews. Like any game that was released in a major franchise, the development tale for Sonic Spinball is quite intriguing. So, let me tell y'all about it. After Sonic 2's initial success in 1992, the following year would see Sega immediately going back to work on the next main game in the series. However, what Sega had in mind was gargantuan, to say the least, and it was going to take almost more than a year and a half to fully develop. During this time, Sega had approached two companies and asked them to make a couple Sonic games. Sonic games that could be made quickly and be out by the 1993 Christmas season. One of the companies that was tasked with making a Sonic game was the Sega Technical Institute, whom, if you recall in my review of Sonic 2, were a team of devs that helped Sega in the development of that particular game. I would say that that was a good idea on Sega's end. Who better than to develop a spin-off Sonic title than a company that helped them out previously? Whilst coming up with an idea for what would eventually become Sonic Spinball, Sega of America's research team had conducted a survey to see what levels from Sonic 2 the fans really liked the most. One of the fan favorites that got a lot of praise was Casino Night Zone. This would be the beginning of what direction the spinoff would take. One of the features from Casino Night Zone was the pinball-like aspect of that particular level. This gave lead programmer Peter Morwick, who was an avid fan of the Amiga game Pinball Dreams, the idea to make a pinball-based Sonic game. Morwick showcased the idea to Sega's senior management, and they liked it so much that they greenlit it immediately. The devs knew full well that they had a lot on their plate, 
The game had to be finished in a short amount of time so that it could be released for Christmas, and had to meet with a certain standard of quality. This was a daunting task, but not one that Morwick and his team couldn't handle. To make sure that Sonic Spinball's development went smoothly, Sega of Japan sent a few of their own devs that weren't working on the next main Sonic title to help with Spinball. One of those devs was regular Sonic game art coordinator Katsuhiko Sato. Mr. Sato, along with Morwick, would become a driving force behind the development of Sonic Spinball. During the mid-construction of the game, the team did run into one problem, and that was the programming language. Due to the complexity of the particular language, it was taking the devs far longer than it should have to complete. To remedy this issue, the team decided to change the old programming language to an easier and faster language so that the game could be finished on time. And that proved to be a good idea because by the end of October 1993, Sonic Spinball was ready. Now, when the game was finally released the following month, Morwick was quite unsure whether Sonic Spinball would be received well. To his surprise, though, it did end up selling well, and the reception for it was good. So, without further ado, let me show y'all this game. So the game starts with a rendition of that iconic sound, and the game begins. At this point, it's become pretty much a franchise staple. You start up a Sonic game, you hear that iconic Sega noise, you get a little intro sequence, and then you begin the game. I'm glad that Sega kept doing that. Hell, it's still done today with modern Sonic games. The plot of this game is as follows. Dr. Robotnik has built a near-impenetrable citadel called the Vago Fortress atop the active volcano, Mount Mobius. And yes, you heard that correctly. Mount Mobius. As in, Planet Mobius. As in, Spinball is not based off of the regular Sonic Games continuity. Rather, it's based on the Sonic Sat AM cartoons continuity. And if y'all need to know, yeah, I'll eventually review this and other Sonic-related cartoon stuff in the future. I will say this about Sonic Sat AM, though. It's a freaking rockin'-ass cartoon, and I think y'all should search the internet for some episodes to watch. Another indication that this game is based off the Sat AM cartoon is not only the explicit mentioning of Mobius in the manual, but also the cameo appearances of characters such as Rotor, Bunny Rabot, and even Princess Sally. So, yeah, this game is connected to Sat AM. Anyway, Robotnik is capturing defenseless animals all over Mobius and turning them into his robot slaves. Sonic and Tails try to mount an aerial assault on the Vega Fortress, but unfortunately they're attacked by the Fortress's cannons. Sonic is knocked off the plane, but he fortunately manages to find his way into the lower levels of Robotnik's Citadel. After fighting his way through the Vega Fortress's pinball defense system, Sonic finally makes it to Robotnik and the two fight. During their final battle, Mount Mobius erupts, destroying the Vega Fortress and sending both Sonic and Robotnik hurtling into the sky. Sonic is luckily picked up by Tails and they fly off, but sadly for Robotnik, he falls into the center of Mount Mobius and dies a fiery death. Holy shit! Robotnik dies! They've never done something that dark before, nor after this game. That's... Wow! I like to think that this is the story of what happens after Sonic Sat AM ended. It would make sense. One thing that y'all need to know right now is that the game is quite short, only about four levels long. And that's not even counting the bonus stages. Fortunately, the devs remedied this problem by making the game very challenging. Now, don't worry folks, this game doesn't have Mario Lost Level standards of difficulty, thank god. But it's definitely not an easy game. I'm not gonna say that's a bad thing, though. When I first played this game, I was quite young. And in my opinion, when you're young and you're just starting to play video games, playing ones that are more on the challenging side is good for you in the long run. As its name suggests, Sonic Spinball is played very much like a pinball machine. Sonic himself is mostly in ball form throughout 95% of the game. 
it's quite safe to say that Sonic Spinball is less of a platformer and more of a pinball simulator. So, if you're looking for classic Sonic action, you're not going to find much of that here. Not including the bonus stages, there are four zones, and in each one you have to collect a set amount of Chaos Emeralds before you face a boss. Another thing worth noting for this game is that unlike in many other Sonic games, where there are only seven emeralds to collect, Sonic Spinball has 16. That is quite a big jump, but this was during a time when there wasn't exactly a canonical set number of Chaos Emeralds. But I digress, let's take a look at the levels. The first zone is the Toxic Caves. Think of a Sonic version of the sewers from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, complete with pipes, water, and green ooze. Definitely a good start to this game. Not too easy, yet not too hard. Hell, this zone would go on to inspire newer levels in future Sonic titles. Coming up second is the Lava Powerhouse, basically the geothermal plant for the Vega Fortress. This is where things start getting a little harder. It's a bit easier to die here than it is in the Toxic Caves. The level is fun though, in fact it's my favorite in the entire game. The music is also kick-ass. Next we have Zone 3, The Machine. This level is quite long, and unlike in the previous two zones, this one has not three, but five Chaos Emeralds to grab. One unique aspect of this level is that there are probably more platforming segments here than in the rest of the game. Finally, we come to the Showdown Zone, and... who oh boy! I feel the need to tell y'all folks this, because if you're going to play the game, you need to know. The showdown zone is HELL! No, seriously, this level is fucking insane. I get that this is the final zone and thus it's supposed to be the hardest, but Jesus, this level literally wants you dead. On top of having to collect five emeralds, this place is filled to the brim with death traps. It is very, very easy to die in this level. Also, it seems like this zone delights in trolling you, especially once you make it to Robotnik himself. Just... Ugh! Fuck this level, man! This is possibly one of, if not the worst level in any Sonic game. I really hate this zone. Even more so than Labyrinth Zone from Sonic 1. Well, those were the main zones, but as I mentioned before, there are also a few bonus stages to play through. After defeating a boss in three of the four's regular levels, you're awarded with a bonus game. Now, it should be known that playing these bonus stages aren't necessary to beat the game, in fact, you can skip through them if you want, but they are pretty damn fun to play, and they're a good way to score some extra lives. Now, some would call these bonus stages padding, and I'd be lying if I didn't say that they were, but there is a difference between good padding and bad padding. These bonus stages can also be pretty hard. You don't have control over the ball like you do in the regular zones, so it's a little more tricky. Also, each bonus stage is different. The devs didn't just copy and paste the first stage over and over again, and that's good because far too many games do that nowadays. game, I've noticed that it's very visually appealing. Now before I dote on these graphics a bit, I need to say that even though I like the visuals, they're not as good as what was seen in Sonic 2, nor as what was seen in Sonic 1, even. But they're still good. I like how they went for a cartoony animation style for this game, kind of keeping in context with the show it was based on. I should note that the lead programmer of Sonic Spinball, Peter Morwick, was the same lead programmer for the game Comic Zone. If anything, Morwick was really good at capturing what a particular game was supposed to look like. He was damn good at that. 
The visuals of Sonic Spinball goes to show that the devs were aiming for it to look like the Sat AM cartoon. The enemies look like they could have come from the show. The levels look like the locations from the show. Hell, even Sonic himself looks like he's rocking his Sat AM look. Graphically speaking, this game is very pretty to look at. Morwick and his team at the Sega Technical Institute did a fine job capturing that visual presentation from the Sat AM show. You know how Sonic games tend to have really good music? Well, this game does too. For being a spin-off Sonic game, the music is really well composed here. I would have to say that out of all the Sonic games that I've played, and I've played nearly all of them, this one tends to have the most rock-inspired tracks. Two songs in particular sound like punk and industrial tunes. I'll give you an example. Here's Lava Powerhouse's theme. Kinda sounds like a punk song, doesn't it? And here's the Machine Zones theme. Sounds an awful lot like a 16-bit rendition of a KMFDM tune to me. Listening to the music in Sonic Spinball kind of makes me wish modern Sonic games would draw their inspiration from rock and roll more. I think future Sonic titles in general would benefit from that. Alrighty. Well, I'd say we've covered pretty much all we could for this game. But there are a few final thoughts I'd like to share with y'all before giving this game its final grade. So in playing Sonic Spinball, I've discovered that it has really appealing visuals and music. The levels, all for the exception of the Showdown Zone, of course, were cool. The bonus games were nice little distractions. The game was based off of an awesome cartoon. And most importantly, the gameplay was fun. So, do I have any complaints? Yeah, I actually do have a couple. Now, I needn't explain my dislike for the Showdown Zone, because I've already done that, but there are two other things that bring this game down a bit. For one thing, the deaths in Sonic Spinball can be cheap. Very cheap. Such as phasing through one of the flippers or falling straight to your demise and not having any control over Sonic because he's falling down so damn fast. And one other problem is that sometimes, just sometimes, mind you, the pinball physics tend to work against you. For instance, say you want to get to a certain area of the level, but you can't because you have either too much or too little momentum. I understand that this is how pinballs work in real life, but it's still a pain in the ass. Other than that, though, the game is still pretty damn good. The devs cared about their little project, and it shows. They didn't have much time to make this game, and they could have just as easily slapped a few things together and gave us either a very lackluster, or even a bad, Sonic game. But they didn't, and that's good. The devs put some effort forward, and I commend them for that. So, I decided to award this game a G for good. As far as spin-off Sonic games go, it's okay. And hey, I ain't the only one who has that opinion on Sonic Spinball, so to give this episode that extra pizzazz, we have joining with us the incomparable D-Laps. Dylan, it's all you, bro. Hello, everybody. I'm D-Laps, and my good buddy was telling me all the games that he's reviewing, and he mentioned Sonic Pinball. And I'm like, Sonic Pinball? I gotta check this out. So I'm here to do a second opinion on Sonic Pinball. 
Now, I've only played the original Sonic game, and I thought it was okay. You run really fast, you spin around, and everything was kind of blue and greenish. Eh. Now, I have no clue the backstory of Sonic, and in this game it doesn't really matter because all you do is you play pinball with Sonic. At first, I wasn't really expecting to like this game, but I actually like this game. It's colorful, has great physics, it's entertaining, the map size are pretty big, it gives you a bunch of cool objectives to do, like hit this as many times as possible, or hit that as many times as possible. Basically, you'll be hitting a lot of things playing this game, and I don't mind. I actually enjoyed this. I played a lot of pinball when my parents owned an arcade, and this brought back some memories because it's just really fun to play a pinball game, and the fact that it's Sonic, I don't think it hurts. Now one of the really cool things I found interesting about this game is that not only is it pinball, but you actually control Sonic in these odd moments of running around collecting things before you suck back into the pinball game. Another cool little feature that I noticed is that when you lose a ball, you get a small chance to try to recover it before it's lost forever. I like that. I found this game a little easy, but I enjoyed it. Also, not to like be a dick about things, this game actually kept my attention for more than a half an hour, which is surprising because all this old shit normally doesn't. So my final thoughts would be, I really wish they'd make more pinball games like this, because I think this game is on the right track of how I think pinball games should have evolved, and they just didn't. They kind of stayed the exact same way they've been for the last 40 years. So, I'm going to rate this a 7.5. I know that doesn't sound like much, but I don't play this type of stuff, and this was actually cool. Peace, I'm out! Thank you all kindly, Dylan. You know, I always love having that guy on this show. Hey, Shast, you want to give a little opinion about this game? You seem to want to. feeling you weren't fond of this game. Well folks, it's time to end this little shindig, but there's one more Sonic spin-off that we're going to take a look at next, and that's a fun little puzzle title called Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. See y'all in the next episode.